it's that whole fit and finish thing, right? And uh, again, I'm I, when I'm working construction that I really don't care about the finishing carpentry. It's the structure behind the wall because you can put lipstick on a pig and it'll look all right, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so many renovations are all about the, you know, make it pretty. Okay. I'm getting a thumbs up, so I'm on. I got every, and no one ran away. I didn't scare anybody off. Good. Okay, so, that is why. Now we're going to talk about what. You know, when we're talking about competency, we're talking about what this is and how, how this works, what are we really talking about? Uh, what about that? Okay. So I'm going to ask, you know, so you want to come here and learn stuff. But does anybody have, like, uh, I mean, you, you all came here knowing we were going to talk about competency, right? Did anybody come here with a competency issue in their organization? Well, in the end, we, we, well, if we, yeah, that would be cool, but I, yeah, it might, 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 might just, yeah, and it'll be worth, and it'll be worth exactly what you paid for it. <laughs> Which is what free advice is always worth what you paid for it. But anyway, I mean, if you, if you guys, if you have specific issues, um, and I want to encourage you, we've got, you know, kind of the rest of the morning. If you've got specific things going on in your organizations that are just eating you up, things you need to fix, ask. You know, we can, we, we, we can help. We can kick the idea around the room. There's, uh, there's lots of room for us to help each other and, uh, and, and, and learn from each other. Um, one of the things I found, uh, the, uh, uh, someone told me that what you have to be if you're, in a manage, if you're a manager or if you're trying to change things in your organization is you have to learn to be an ask hole, which means ask <laughs> and ask and ask. And if you need help, Ask for it. Become what he called an asshole. <laughs> Be constantly asking. Because the amazing thing is, when you throw that out there, there's other people who have had that problem and they could probably, you know, they may not have solved it, but they can tell you all the ways that didn't work. <laughs> so at least you're further along. So if you have things specifically that you want to take away from this, by all means, talk, let's talk about them during the session. Um, we want this to be as valuable as it can be. Okay. Anybody got anything? No? Okay. If it comes up, don't be shy. Okay. Why is this important around uh, th this whole idea of what? Okay. Uh, Robert Half and Associates, is a, uh, they're a... a a headhunting firm. 60% of small and medium enterprises say they can't find the right skill sets, can't find the right people with the right skills. We also know that SMEs, <coughs> small and medium enterprises, don't have the money to go and find the right skill sets. But their cost for hiring those skills is higher than it is for larger enterprises. Just for fun, how much higher do you reckon it is for a small company versus a very large company to go and hire, like on the cost per hire, to go find the right skill sets? Anybody? I, it, I, I mean, it's, it's not a trick question. I'm just curious if anybody even thinks about this stuff. Okay. Speak into the little speak into the little book you. 
to need to replace employees. And my orientation money that I set aside, I don't know, it's probably, I don't even know what the standard is. I just know that I set aside $500 each month for onboarding costs of bringing a person in. Okay. Regular employee. Yep. Different from my recruiting costs for professionals. Okay. Does anybody also uh, track that in HR on what it actually costs you to go bring in talent or bring in talent again? And again, and again, and again. Okay. The average cost in the U.S. for small companies. Okay. Now, in the U.S., a small company uh, is you know less than a thousand people. Where our definition of a small and medium-sized enterprise is smaller than that. But Boston and Associates, another consulting company said the cost per hire, when you cut not only the cost of going and finding the person, bringing the person, onboarding the person, then getting rid of them when they're the wrong person and bringing in the next person, and the, the total cost is over $3,600 U.S. per hire. This is over and above the salaries of the individual that you hire. This is just the opportunity costs and productivity costs and everything else. $3,665 per hire. Big companies are only about two grand per hire because they have systems in place and everything else. So they're actually, they spend less money per hire and they don't have the, uh, the same issue because everybody wants to go work for Suncor and no one wants to work for the little oil and gas company. They have less trouble finding the right people because they can attract them because they're big. So the small companies really need to look at what they are offering outside of compensation and everything else in order to lower that cost per hire, get the right person the first time, and keep them around and grow them. Because it's huge expenses to do this. Okay. So how do you get there? What is competent? Okay. If you've defined your company around these core uh, and underlying competencies and skill sets, okay, you can clarify what your talent requirements really are. It's easier to find something if you know what you're looking for. It's anybody who's ever looked for a pair of socks. Right? It, the hint is it's always the last place you look. So you should look there first. Um, for some reason, these are all number one. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, sorry, I'm having a moment. So, if you define in terms, start with competencies at the bottom end. We're going to have an exercise at the end of the uh, of the session around this, but it helps you really helps you clarify what your talent real talent requirements are. It helps you find the right person. It helps you select the right people. And it helps you put the right people together the right ways with the right mix of underlying competencies to create that team. Right? This is what general managers do in hockey teams. It's not who can fog a mirror. It's what set of talents do I need to create the right dressing room. It's not just about getting all of the best skills because you need grinders and you need this and you need that, right? So it's about creating a mix of talent by understanding what it is that it takes to win. Okay? So we talk about competencies and critical skills at the core of your business. Okay? So all of this stuff, strategy, workforce planning, performance, employee development, training, talent, all is based on and drives from these competencies and critical skill sets. And some of them are technical, but most of them aren't. And the interesting thing is, if you look at really successful companies uh, that are disrupting their industries, you know, you go back to WestJet back in the beginning. WestJet's become just another airline. But in the old days, when they were kind of weird, they, they, they hired people from the hospitality industry not the transportation industry. 
because people aren't cargo. And they were in the hospitality business. So on the presumption that if you've got the right customer service and hospitality mindset, we can teach you the technical skills that you need. And so they built an entire successful company around this idea of these underlying core competencies. And we'll worry about the technical stuff later. So it's at the heart of your business. Okay. And, and, and the neat thing is that all of this stuff, okay, in terms of these underlying core skills, core competencies, skills, are, you're not born with any of this stuff. Right? These are not character traits. These are learned behaviors. Okay. One of the things I learned in the military, because I mean, the military does lots of things wrong, but one thing the military has done and does well and has always done well, going all the way back to the Roman legions, is develop leaders. And the military, when times are good, the only people who join the military are people who can't get a real job. And when I joined the military, times were pretty good. So <laughs> we, were all, we, were, we were the dregs. We were the people that couldn't get a real job. The military takes people from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds, from all across the country, from all different social strata, and teaches them how to lead, first and foremost, because those are learned behaviors. And the underlying competencies are learned behaviors. Okay. You can learn how to communicate. You can learn how to, uh, you can actually, you can learn how to be creative. Some people find it easier than others, but it, these are still learned behaviors. Okay. So when we're looking at critical skills, okay, Recognizing that you can, people can, you know, unless unless there's an absolute requirement for something that you're born with, like I don't know, eyes. Almost everything else you can learn, and the critical skills are those learnable things that are so important to the success of a job. Okay, some of those are uh, occupation or industry agnostic. They're not tied to a particular job title or a particular occupational title. And what we're finding through the research is that, in fact, most of the things that people that make people successful are not specific to their occupational title. It's this idea of transferable skills, cross-functional skills. Uh, for uh, uh, people in a, uh, in a changing environment in where we're all going to be uh, moving from job to job in a gig economy. This idea of building transferable skill, of building these underlying competencies, is what makes you marketable. Um, and it's also what makes your organization perform better. Okay. So we already said, you know, it's this, it, this uh, idea of applied skill, knowledge, abilities, behaviors in a context of your organization to generate specific results. Think about them that way. Okay. And we're not just talking about the what. We're talking about the what and the how. How you go about doing it is almost as important as what you do. Back on my Dreyfus scale, and I'm not going to flip slides because that's going to screw Scott up. Uh, won't screw Scott up? That's okay. They can't read the slide anyway because it's too small. But we talked about, you know, uh, from, imagine there's a Dreyfus scale slide there. Imagine you could see it. Novice, I'm stupid, to expert, I'm really smart, and I'll tell you it's so at the copy. We want people, we say we want them down here in this, uh, in this area of uh, competent, proficient, uh, professional. What characterizes competent, proficient, professional is the what the how, and the why. The, the, the closer you get to expert status is when you start to decide not only what I'm going to do, not only how I'm going to do it, but whether I should even do it at all. 
And that characterizes movement along that uh, continuum from novice to expert. At the expert level, they decide whether it needs to be done, whether they should do anything. And that's, you know, that's where professionalism begins, is those levels of judgment. So we're focusing on what and how for most of the organization. And the whole organization should always be focused on what? The first rule should be, the first, the first line in the checklist, if you insist on having them, should be, should I follow the checklist? <laughs> or is it time to kick that thing over the side and chase the puck? Yeah, this is one of Bev's slides. <laughs> um, so when we, when we look at this, and, the, and these things, they evolve, right? We had critical skills. A hundred and odd years ago, when this, uh, when this part of the world was getting settled, there were critical skills. And you needed them. And people, were, people grew up learning them. And it's amazing to me that, I mean, in my generation, I grew up in the 60s and the early 70s, um, no one ever taught us how to do any of that stuff like, I don't know, change a flat. We didn't have YouTube. We couldn't look, right? No one taught us how to make a fence. No one taught us how to drywall. No one taught us how to, you know, build a shed. You just, you just knew. You learned because you watched all of your, you know, your dad and your neighbors, and they're all doing the same thing. And, you, and, and so those skills were acquired over time. We had critical skills back then. Now there's another critical skill is how to look it up on YouTube. But uh, in the new world, because the robots are coming, there's a new set of critical skills. Right? Anybody any idea? Just curious. What is the new most important skill set? Anyone? Say again. IT. IT. IT isn't a skill, it's a disease. <laughs> it's important. Yeah, digital skills are, are, are critical in this environment. Anybody else? What are the critical skills? Um, perhaps research and knowing how to research. Learning how to learn. Learning how to learn, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how about that? Critical skill sets. Yeah, in the uh, auto business, right? What is the critical skill set? Um, well, like customer service. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Okay. What is it that robots can't do? Robots managers have no emotion either unless the emotion is pissed off. Okay. But, yeah. What is it that makes us useful are the same things that make us human. So... In a world where Bend is coming to take your job, these kinds of skills for the present and the future are the ones that are going to keep you and your organization nimble, agile, and relevant. Critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, leadership, ability to collaborate. And oddly enough, these are those things that, you, uh, that live in that world called essential skills. Working with other people, etc. Okay? There's a, a fellow named Alex Escher um, who uh, writes a, a blog uh, called uh, uh, well, One Thought to Start Your Day, but his company is called Higher Education Strategy Associates. And they, so he writes all this stuff, and it's mostly aimed at post-secondary institutions. But every now and again, there's a nugget of really cool stuff in there, and it talks a lot about competency. So us, us competency, competency geeks read his stuff every day because it's always challenging. 
And we talked about, because we're always talking about STEM, we need more people to go through science, technology, engineering, math, you know, all the kids got to learn how to code, right? And he said, well, the reality is that the machines are starting to code themselves now. They're starting to, the, the, the artificial intelligence is, is, is being used to create itself. It's being, the next generation of machine learning is being generated by other machines. But he defined the critical skill set as being a Nordstrom philologist. Has everybody ever been to Nordstrom's? Right? High-end department store? What is the one underlying characteristic of Nordstrom's with the, uh, with the, the, in terms of their employees? Anyone? Anybody have to interact with any of them? Okay. Customer service. They have this unbelievable customer service empathetic, make the customer happy focus. And they're empowered to make all of the decisions necessary to make sure that that customer leaves happy. Okay. And a philologist is a, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a discipline that we don't actually use anymore, but in the old days, it's the, the root of Western education. The idea of taking uh, text in uh, you know, hieroglyphics and whatever from ancient civilizations, translating them and then connecting knowledge from all of these different places to create new knowledge. So, in Al what Alex said is the ideal employee of the future is a Nordstrom philologist, someone with the deep rooted need to empathize and please the customer on the one hand, with the mental acuity and decision-making capability and an analytical capability to do what philologists used to do. You pull all of this information together, make decisions, and then deliver. That's your ideal employee. If you have an organization made up entirely of those kinds of skill sets, the sky's the limit. You can do, create, almost anything. And so these are, like I said, the, the underlying critical skills. If you are still looking at manual, procedural, you know, not that they're not important, they are, but that's, again, that's focusing you at the top of that Dreyfus scale in terms of... Uh, uh, novices and at, at best advanced beginners. And if what you want is to go play in the NHL with a Tim Bit hockey team, go for it. But you will not be successful. Okay. When you invest in talent and and uh, and and invest particularly in these underlying core root foundational things. It turns into, uh, it's like any other muscle, right? When you, uh, when, you, when you exercise it, when you invest in it, it gets bigger and it, and it, and it gets stronger. So strength is a, is a function of uh, these underlying talent or skills that are invested in to grow them, and it creates uh, this core of strength that runs through your organization. And it's those... That my, my bender slide. There he is. Okay. And, and if, you, if you focus all of your training activity around, even if you're teaching procedural stuff, but you're teaching it in the context of how to use these skills, you're growing that capability within your organization, and you're taking the chain off the baby elephant and pushing it towards the fence or where the fence used to be. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So I want to talk about competencies, the what, and this is, relates very closely to the exercise at the end of the thing. There's core competencies that are uh, kind of generic. 
they're, uh, they're, they're, they're almost values-based. They exist. They're, they're what drives your organization. They're what your organization believes in. So they apply no matter where you work in the company. So they're the first thing you select on. Is do they, this one ever talks about cultural fit? Cultural fit is almost always based on these kinds of core beliefs and core competencies, core behaviors. Okay. Your organization has a culture, whether you, you know, wh 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 either, either by, by accident or by design. And those, again, this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to change organizations that have existed in a particular way of doing things, because the values, the things that drive these core behaviors are embedded in the DNA of the organization. That's why leadership, top from the top all the way through, is absolutely required to generate these kinds of changes and changes in behavior. Okay. So core competencies are the things that I don't care if you're the, you know, the, the, the person that dumps the waste baskets or you're the CEO. You all got to have them. Okay. Defining what they are is important. Okay, so examples. Teamwork and cooperation. Everybody has that in somewhere? They, we want to work in teams? Okay, we all do it. I'd love to read some of your mission and value statements, some of your companies, because I'm sure they'd all look almost the same because they were all written by consultants. Get a guess, right? How many, I, I, anybody here been at that top level management where they go into this whole values-based discussion around mission and vision and all that? How many people left wanting to puke? I, I'm just curious. Did, you, it's okay. You you can leave wanting to puke, okay? Because they so they come out and they're, they're not they don't mean anything, you know. And you can ask most people you know in companies that have these, most of them wouldn't know what they were. You know, we work with one organization, nonprofit organization. So I'll pick on them for a second, but um, sorry, but I'll pick on nonprofit. But I asked. This wasn't a big board of directors in this nonprofit. I asked six different people on the board of directors what were their core values, mission, vision, values, and that within the organization, and I got six different answers. And they couldn't figure out why the organization was so dysfunctional. Because they didn't really understand why they existed and what, what, what mattered to them. So teamwork and cooperation, that's one example of a core competency. Doesn't matter unless... You know, you're, you're, uh, unless, unless you're in a 100% in individual sport, and there's no such thing anymore, uh, because even in golf, you've got a team of people around you and behind you, and you've got a caddy and everything else, right? There is no such thing as people who work in complete isolation anymore. So this is one of the core competencies. Everybody probably needs it, right? And that is the kind of mealy mouth bleh, kind of, uh, these are actually taken from uh, somebody's job description to describe how they embody that teamwork and cooperation. Like that, I, it, I, I, I can see that, I can find myself in it, I can see behaviors that I should be doing in it, but man, that's hard. Anybody have job descriptions that look like that? Just curious. Okay. Depending on where you are in the organizational chart, statements like this are meaningless. They really are. Job specific stuff. Uh, now we're getting into more uh, occupation or role-specific uh, competencies, okay? This is where you get into the technical stuff. So we start with the underlying core, and then we build and layer on the technical stuff. The interesting thing is a lot of the technical competencies aren't even specific to a particular occupation or, or job function anymore either. They're becoming far more generic. So... Um, what used to be rigid lines between occupations are no longer 
rigid lines between occupations. There's so much of what people do and the way they do it is the same across many occupations. But the tech, the what and how uh, of the job specific stuff, and that needs to be articulated as well. And what I like to do is start from the other end. And so they always tell us in design thinking, you know, begin with the end in mind. So if you start with the idea like, why are we here? What is it? What, what, what is our purpose? What does the organization exist for? And then what are the underlying things that allow us to do that? And it's the same when you get into job specific stuff. What are the outcomes of the work? What are the outputs? Okay. What do you expect? The end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the quarter, what do you expect that particular position, that particular individual to have produced? What value will they have created? And then from there, okay, what would allow that value to be created? And build job descriptions around that. Okay. Does anybody do that? Anybody? That's why, why they won't let me come to HR conferences and talk, because I scare the HR people. But that's what's important. Right? And again, I'll use sports analogies. When they're trying to build a winning team, right? when uh, they're, you know, they're talking to whoever the management team is and the coaches that they've selected to select that Olympic hockey team, they're always talking about these, well, we need a, you know, what do we want in the room, right? How, what are the, we need people who know how to win, you know, and it's, and these are our catchphrases, but what they're really talking about is at the end of the day, what is that output that you expect individually and collectively, and then how does that translate into specific technical skills and underlying core competencies that create winning? And if it was an easy exercise, everybody would do it, so if it's confusing you, that's fine. You'll have a chance to practice it at the end of the session. It's really hard to do. It's really hard to think this way. Which is why most HR departments and operational managers say, oh, just go get me a millwright. Why a millwright? Why, you know, what, what is it that you want the job to do? What is it that you want the role to accomplish? How will that position generate value? And, and that's a completely different way of looking at job descriptions and organizational descriptions because they're not now so much role dependent as output dependent. And who can fill the role? Anybody capable of making the output. Okay. So when we talk about the job specific stuff, again, think in terms of outputs, but you know, we're talking, you know, th this is, a, a, again, a very high-level one that talked about, uh, you know, in terms of business, business systems expertise, right? But what do you want to see that person do? This is a management thing, right? I want to hire someone. I want them to be a mid-level manager. What do I want them to do? Do I want them to generate exactly the program, you know, and do it exactly the way it's always been done? Or do I want to see someone who is, I can visibly observe them every single day, taking initiative, making changes, trying new things, right? Applying all of the background technical knowledge and skills that they bring to the table, which is why I hired them in the first place. How are they using that to improve my organization? How are they using that on their own? Not because I told them to, but just because it's in their DNA to make things better, okay, how are they doing that to improve their operation, to change their operation? Okay. Again, Chris and I were talking on the way down here, and I was mentioning a company that I was looking at down in the States. And their whole philosophy is, if you come into work, and at the end of the quarter or the end of the year, you're 10 out of 10 across the board on your, uh, on your performance evaluation, you're in the wrong job. And if you're happy 
being 10 out of 10, you're in the wrong company. Because they want everybody to come to work every single day and think about, how am I going to get better? What is it that I need to improve? Knowing they're constantly in that level of ambiguity. And the minute they get to where they're comfortable, it's time to move on. Move them into a different job. Never let them get comfortable. And I was surprised because I thought, well, that must be, you know, we were saying, well, what kind of company was that? It must be a tech company. It must be Google or something. They're an insurance company. No one expects insurance people to think that way, right? It's always, what, what does the policy say? What is it? It's, all, it, it's very pedantic. But they're in a competitive environment, and they want to beat the hell out of, their, uh, out of their competitors. So they come in every day trying to figure out how to disrupt. And they want everybody there to be uncomfortable. Comfortable being uncomfortable. Okay. So, if, again, it's not about, you know, the technical and business system expertise. Yes. Measurable skill set. I can look at what you've done in the past. I can look at where you've performed before. But if what we're after is organizational change, is, uh, is, is growth, is improvement, we want to be able to work at someone every single day in a management position and watch them make mistakes. How scary is that? How many organizations encourage mistake making? Embrace failure. Anybody work for a place like that? You embrace failure? You good at it? <laughs> it's the only way to go. Right? One of the reasons why, and I, I didn't realize this at the time, but one of the reasons why in the military they did such a good job of training leaders is because from day one, you were put in positions to fail. And you fail in small ways through exercises, through training, through simulations, through everything else. You learn all the possible ways there are to do it wrong so that you can grow and, get, and make bigger and more expensive decisions later that will, won't cost people their lives. They're really good at this idea of you know, almost uh, 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 programmed creative failure in the organization. Um, and, and pushing that boundary of, you know, okay, so it doesn't matter how well it went, what did we screw up? Because we used to screw up something. <laughs> we always do. Let's learn from that. Let's, let's grow that. Let's, let's, and, let, and let's come in tomorrow and let's figure another way to screw it up and get better at it as we go. That's how you grow uh, uh, skill. That kind of, you know, again, that may be, when we went back to the other one, that's a core competency, the ability to embrace, you know, micro failure as a learning tool, encouraging people to do things differently and learn from the experience, okay? And you put limits on that, right? But you, you grow organizationally that way, right? Otherwise, you wind up with an organization playing Timbit hockey. And you've got, that's, if that's what you want, but most people don't. So anyway, in job-specific competencies, again, I want to look at not only the, you know, what are your technical stuff, but what, how do you apply that for the outcomes that we want in the context of the values, the core values of the organization in generating value for our customer? How is that expressed in the way you apply those skills? So I'll give you some real-world examples. I already gave you one, so I got ahead of myself. But it's okay, we can skip. There's an organization down in the U.S. Uh, they did a thing down in Albuquerque. Um, the organization is called Innovate and Educate. They're, uh, they're a nonprofit group. And they, uh, they encouraged a bunch of companies down in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, to come in and do uh, competency-based hiring. And they brought in a bunch of kids, young folk, uh, kind of high school age or just out of high school age, 300 people. Uh, 
that were hired based on what they demonstrated to these interviewers and to these companies uh, without ever showing them a resume, just in terms of their underlying work ethic and, 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 and ability to, to get along with other people and everything else, and demonstrated ability to work together on specific tasks. And they got 300 kids that otherwise would have wound up on welfare or, uh, or in a gang, and they got them all jobs. And no one wrote a resume. You guys, we had, uh, you know, in one case, they they, uh, they they took a bunch of kids and they were playing basketball. And they wanted they looked and said, how do they play together? How do they cooperate? And most of could didn't know each other. So how do they form an, a team around a goal, having never played together, having never worked? What do they do? Because they understood the rules of the game, but they had no idea what anybody else was good. They had to figure that out as they went. So they, they'd have them play games like that, or they'd have them do other things. And then they hired on the basis of these uh, underlying competencies, or they'd given problems to solve as a team. Again, select from a, randomly from a group of, of kids, give them a, you know, a desert island kind of problem, the kind we all had in, you know, when we go through these uh, uh, seminars, how do they react? What do they do? What questions do they ask? What do they do when someone else asks a question? How do they react to that? And they hired them on this basis of these underlying skills in the jobs that they had no idea they'd be able to do without ever seeing a resume, and they were very successful because they picked based on these underlying competencies. Next gen. This is a company uh, in New Jersey. Uh, they do uh, or did uh, e-commerce software, and they hire the way everybody hires in the in the tech industry, right? They go to the best schools, hire the best grads. Uh, you know, and the problem is they're a small company and they can't compete against Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Amazon for the top, top, top people. So they get the ones left over. Okay. And they're still very skilled, but they were doing the same thing, and they couldn't afford to outgun, you know, the big tech companies. And when it started in 2006, and one of the executives commented that what we found out was what we hired only on the basis of these technical skills. Can you code? Can you do this? Can you do that? Based on their, uh, on their grades in school or whatever. And he said, what we wound up with was an engineering team that was full of really, really, really skilled jackasses. So they fired half of their engineering department, and they started doing this. They call it Super Saturdays. They go on the paradigm that anybody who's graduated from a uh, computer programming program in a, in a university all know how to code, or at least have proven that they can learn how. So we'll take that as a basis. They invite those candidates that they want into these things they call a Super Saturday, and it's at their, uh, their, their corporate headquarters. And they run them through an orientation. Uh, and there's, again, it's almost like what uh, uh, the, they did in, uh, uh, in Albuquerque. There's games, there's simulations, there's little job sessions, there's things like that. And they're constantly under the observation of the rest of the employees who are running these simulations. And they all have an app on their smartphone. And they're looking for specific behaviors. And when they see them in Candidate X, they, you know, swipe left, swipe right, and it all goes back to the war room, and it's all being compiled. And it's just like the TV show, was it Big Brother or something? You may know at the beginning that you're on camera, but about 10 minutes in, you forget, and you start acting like yourself. They see people how they really are. Because it's easy to lie on a resume. We've all done it. Come on, admit it. Anybody here not embellish the facts a little bit on a resume ever? Yeah? Okay. So they 
they're fired. <laughs> okay, so we do this, and you still look, and again, same thing. How do they react? What questions do they ask? How do they react to the questions that other people ask? How do they work together? How do they react to authority in the face of authority, but also when people think they're not looking? And then they hire the ones who they want to work with. And their turnover is low, their productivity is high, they're very, very successful, and they no longer have an engineering department full of very competent jerks. So this is a, this is a cool example. Oh, yeah. The cool thing is, they're, 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 not, they're, not, they're not the only ones. There's actually uh, a couple of uh, Canadian companies out of Waterloo now in that whole BlackBerry hub. They're hiring music grads to code because music is a language. It's a mathematical language just like computer code, right? It's all zeros and ones. And they found the best coding. You teach anybody zeros and ones. The best coders were music grads because they had the creativity and the ability to string together. I mean, there's only seven notes, right? I think. And they could do music. How many notes are there? A to, a to F, G? And then there's some, sharps, there's some sharps and flats in there, but whatever, right? So there's 12, maybe, if you count the sharps and flats. And look at all the ways that music people can put those 12 things together into completely different and creative ways to make all kinds of really cool stuff. And they're still only using 12 notes. Wow. Now, what if we can get that creativity, that way of thinking, and apply it to computer coding? And so they have. And I thought the other thing we find is uh, people with multiple languages. Right? Because if you can think in more than one language, your brain does weird things. I'm not a neuroscientist, but being able to actually operate in multiple languages gives you the mental flexibility to adapt to ambiguous situations and, uh, and deliver value. That's why you should hire an immigrant. Because they think in multiple languages. Okay? So that's next jump. Random House, the, uh, the publishing company, um, they're looking at this, right? Uh, they don't have any more degree requirements for en for management positions, entry level management positions at Random Penguin House or yeah, Penguin Random House. They don't care. They don't care if you went to school or where you went to school or what you took if you did go. They're making all their hiring decisions now based on do you have these underlying core competencies and the ability to work with other people and, uh, and, and grow and create. In my industry, uh, in advisory, management consulting, EY and Deloitte won't let the hiring managers know where you went to school anymore. On the basis of if you got that far, it doesn't matter. So we're not making decisions on the basis of, well, did they graduate from Harvard? Because we only want Harvard grads. No. They want, and, they, and they do the same thing. They're testing mental acuity and the ability to think on their feet more than they're testing whether they could uh, pass the, uh, the, the MBA program at whatever school they went to. Okay. And Godzilla, who uh, they, uh, they have said categorically that they consider uh, the, the traditional hiring methods using degrees and credentials uh, as being completely a waste of everybody's time. Uh, and they won't, uh, they're, they're not using resumes or degrees or credentials anymore in their hiring. What they want to see, I mean, they're doing hackathons and code wars and things like that, hiring on the basis, show us what you can do. And, uh, and then putting them in teams and seeing how that works, because that's what they want. 
because if, 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 if you learn how to code once, you'll learn how to code again. And the reality is that what you learned in school three years ago is obsolete now anyway. So if you learned anything in the computer world, in the technical world, and it's more than 18 months old, no one's doing it. So we don't care what your marks were. What can you do? How can you do this? And the tech world's always worked this way because the tech world has always moved faster than the schools. They're always, in some cases, a decade ahead of the universities in terms of teaching. You know, the, the universities are teaching, uh, you know, particular programs, particular things. And the actual tech world, they're not, they're not using any of that stuff anymore. They've gone beyond it. So in my day, I mean, we were programming with punch cards. Let's see how old everybody is. Everybody know what a punch card is? Yeah. So we were doing Fortran with punch cards on mainframe computers in the mid-1980s. But the Macintosh was introduced in 1984. And the world went to graphical user interfaces with, uh, with Macs and, uh, and with uh, the earlier versions of Windows in the mid-80s. But we were still training using COBOL and Fortran and, uh, like I said, and punch cards. The tech world has gone way beyond that. So they so are not even working. So, summing it up. When we do this, and when we're looking at this in the exercise at the end of the program, okay, we're going to be talking about running, you know, competency, competency, your whole competency program. Okay, understand what it is that your organization values. Why do you exist? Goes back to Drucker's Prime Directive, right? The only reason your company exists is to create value in the eyes of your customer. So, what are you doing to create value? in the eyes of your customer. The competency program, performance and development, all has to be linked around this notion of value and how do we generate it and how do we generate it together, okay? If you do this right, okay, no one should ever be confused about what their performance objectives are. No one should ever be uh, uh, sh should ever be surprised at the end of the uh, uh, of the year when they get their assessment and find out that they're a slug, because it should be blindingly obvious at ev every day when they come to work. There should be no surprises. Those conversations that happen at the end of the year can be happening on an ongoing basis. Performance expectations and performance management, okay, are all. You know, the feedback that managers and supervisors give, all generated based on these core competencies and how are they being applied to generate value for our customer. Okay. And it allows you to grow people without changing their job title. And the cool thing is it allows you to grow people, potentially, without paying them more. Because you let them bring all of their skills to work. Okay. Now, I always talk about working like a dog, right? We should all be so lucky to come to work every day and work like a dog. Have anybody ever watched a dog work? Anybody? Anybody got retrievers? Okay. Oh, yeah, labs? Yeah, okay. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? A dog comes to work, gets to use all of its skill, every day, doing work that it loves, doing what it was born to do. Every day, if you're training them, they, they learn how to do it a little bit better and a little bit more, and they you know, do whatever. Let's cross this one off your list. A new feature update is ready to install. Uh, remind me when I'm not here. Right? So, and that dog, the best reward it can get is that it gets to come to work and do the same thing tomorrow. And it's so happy. Wouldn't it be cool if we could all work that way? 
if we could all work like dogs. Wouldn't that be great? I'd love to do that. I'd love to work like a dog. Anyway, so we know career progression and growth within a role based on these underlying or, uh, competencies. And the best part of it, in the beginning I talked about it, uh, retention and, uh, and engagement, right? Why is it that close to 70% of, uh, of workers in, uh, I know it's in the U.S., but it's probably North America wide, really come to work and really don't give a rat's ass about what they're doing or who they're working for, right? And the reason is because no one's developing these underlying pieces and giving them a reason to work like a dog and use all their latent skill. So if you're doing this, uh, you know, they, 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 they always say, if, you know, if you're, if you're focusing on employee development, you're spending money, you're investing, what if I do it and they're going to, you know, and then they'll go and work for my competitor. And I think my, my suggestion, I'll, I'll quote uh, Richard Branson. Everybody knows Richard Branson, Virgin Airlines, Virgin, well, Virgin everything, I guess, now. And what his, his philosophy is, build up the people, treat the employees so well, you know, build them up, train them so well that they're able to go someplace else, but treat them so well so that they don't want to. So if people are going to go away from your organization because you trained them, there's, an under, there's another problem, and it, it may not be that you spent money training them. We find, actually, the, uh, the evidence is that if you invest in these skills and you invest in growing people and growing these cap capabilities, these people don't leave. In fact, they'll accept less money to work someplace where they're being developed. Okay? How's that? I can spend less money, get higher performance, lower my hiring costs, please my customers, and have a happy workforce. All by investing in competency and giving people an opportunity to not only develop their competency, but express it and grow it. Okay? So, when you're talking competencies, what, how, and I would add, why? How does it reflect the core values of the organization? How do these things underpin performance? Okay. They're absolutely critical. If you look at this stuff the right way, every single thing your organization does becomes a training moment, an opportunity to grow these underlying competencies. People spend most of their working li or most of their lives at work. They're learning all the time. You just might not realize what you're teaching. So create an organizational mindset that's constantly learning and growing those core competencies because of the way you operate, because of the way you talk to people, because of the way you handle problems. Use them as learning moments. Okay? Questions on that before our next break? Have we confused you all? Have I, I haven't scared anybody off. In fact, I got an extra buddy in. That's great. Welcome aboard. <laughs> okay. Anything? Good, bad, indifferent. All right. You have to uh, take another uh, another ten. All right. Ten minute break, and then uh, we'll get back together. I got one more little session and then we'll uh, drive to the uh, exercise. Okay? Take 10.